Kanisha Phelps. I work at St. A in Milwaukee. I am the staff development coordinator there. I have been there mm, about a year and a half. Prior to that, I was a special, oh, too loud now, sorry. Um, prior to that, I was a special education teacher for about seven years in Milwaukee. Um, the types of kids that I had were my favorite kids. Um, they are the ones that people describe as, I'll, I'll do the, the bad kids, um, the difficult kids. Oh God, I don't want those kids, those kids. But those are my favorite types of kids. Um, prior to that, I have 11 years of corporate kind of training and instructional design uh, background where I did a lot of um, facilitation around diversity, uh, privilege, um, microaggressions, those types of things. So I'm excited to be here with you today. The topic that I'm going to talk about is one that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's the trauma-informed care movement. And what St. A has done is we've taken, how many people in here have heard of trauma-informed care? Pretty much all, of course. Um, probably preaching to the choir this whole workshop. So um, what we've done with our model, our seven essential ingredients, what we call our 70i of trauma-informed care, is we've turned it into a model for schools where we're um, kind of going with the trauma-sensitive schools movement. And so what I will tell you is this is usually like a six hour presentation. And so when they asked me to come, I was so excited. And then when they said you have an hour, I was in, in panic mode. Like, but I want to tell them all of it. I want to, I want to give you all of it. Trauma sensitive schools. And at any time that you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. It has to be on or it doesn't work. <laughs> Here we go. So let's start off with what's going on nationally. Lots of things. Um, I won't go through everything on the list. I do want to highlight some of my favorites on the list. Um, one is that Compton Unified School District. Is anyone aware of the lawsuit in Compton right now? So one, one person, two people. Um, so what's going on in Compton is they are actually, the school district has been sued, a class action lawsuit. Um, what was going on were things like, for example, a student fell asleep on top of the school, one of the schools, and the school suspended her, maybe even expelled her, actually. Um, what the schools were finding were that lots of kids were having adverse experiences and were pretty much being penalized at school for their circumstances. And so they ended up uh, filing a class action lawsuit against the school. People are watching this very closely because what, is, um, what possibly could come out of this is making trauma an actual protected class. Um, I call it the alphabet soup when kids come into your class and they have the OHI, the ADHD, the, you know, all, all of the alphabet soup that we give kids behind their names, but they're actually trying to make trauma um, and toxic stress an actual protected class. So um, pay attention to that. Um, Google it. Google um, some of the research and the articles and the interviews that are actually going on behind this. Um, another thing, Philadelphia is really big in uh, the urban ACE studies right now. I'll talk about Dr. Roy Waite in a little bit. Um, basically, when we talk about ACEs today, Dr. Wade has said, you know what? This work that was done around ACEs, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, this is really good, but how do we make it real for our community? And so what he did was, I'll show you it, um, he created his own ACE study. And he said, we can tackle these problems when we can get to the actual problems of our community. And so that's pretty big um, nationally as well. If we go down locally, um, lots of things are happening. ACE Interface, how many people have gone through an ACE Interface training? Wisconsin is, oh my God, two people. So ACE Interface is a free training. There are people who are certified ACE Interface trainers and they will come to you um, your schools, your communities. Um, in Milwaukee, we're doing some even in the local libraries. Just to explain what the ACEs study was and how it actually pertains to Wisconsin. Um, the ACEs studies have been done in every city in Wisconsin. And so there's data around that, really good stuff. So I encourage you to look up the ACE interface project as well. Also, um, St. A has been partnered with um, the urban ACEs study for Milwaukee. So what Roy Wade is, Dr. Roy Wade is doing in Philadelphia, Milwaukee is trying to do that to say, what are the experiences that our kids are going through that impact their lives, that actually impact 
the way that they um, behave, the way their brain changes. We'll talk about how the brain change, changes in a little bit. Sorry, I'm, I was so excited. I saw this little cheat because I didn't want to keep doing this. <laughs> and so I have a screen up here. So excuse me if it looks like I'm not looking at you and I'm looking at the floor. Um, another big thing that you all, oh, how many educators are in the room? Is this mainly educators? Okay, um, educators, parents, if you work with people, um, this next slide actually shows the project that's going on with DPI right now. My director, Sarah Daniel, is one of the people who was um, charged with writing the free modules. So you all have access. If you go to the website, and I believe it's on one of the handouts that I gave you, the website, you all have access to the free, I believe there's 14 modules um, around trauma, around ACEs, around toxic stress, around uh, developmental trauma, caregiver, everything I talk about today, there are similar modules, um, not in as much depth, but very good, very useful tools for you. Um, links to um, work that we've done, created worksheets that you can use in your schools. So um, please use that uh, free resource. I did give them to them on Monday, so, okay, I'll speak with Emily about that. Thank you, yes. It was on your screen, but I wanted to just give a shout out to Paper Tigers. Oh, yes. How many people have seen Paper Tigers? So Robert Redford's son, Jamie Redford, um, directed a wonderful movie. I was actually going to play the trailer, but like I said, this is usually a six hour workshop and I had to pick and choose how much good stuff I could share with you. But I did wanna call out Paper Tigers, thank you. So Paper Tigers, awesome film. Um, true story, it is about a high school in Washington who they really approached, um, they really grasped the concept of trauma sensitive schools, um, helping kids cope, helping kids feel. <laughs> Um, helping kids know that it's okay to feel and helping kids to understand that, you know, their circumstances are just one small piece of a big picture. And so it's an awesome um, film. And there's actually uh, a follow-up to it called Resilience. So you can also Google that trailer too. So what is trauma-sensitive schools there? People are talking about it. Um, I like to tell people it's not the flavor of the day. Um, people get really big and, and they want to say, well, you know, okay, this is great, and when it's over, what do you think will be next? And I always say, it's not going to be over. It, it can't be. It can't just be, you know, the flavor of the day. It would be nice to not have to uh, worry about if my school will be trauma-informed, if my school will be trauma-sensitive, um, but that would be unrealistic, and it would mean that all of the world's problems are solved. <laughs> and so um, this is kind of what it is. I like to tell people it's... It's, for me, it's a state of mind. It is what I believe, it is what um, my philosophy has to be based around when I'm working with kids, all kids. Um, let me go to the next one, the next slide. In other words, it's not a program. So sometimes I will get called into a school and they will say, make us trauma sensitive. And I tell them, well, the, I wish I had a package to sell, I'd be rich, but I don't have that. It's not necessarily a product. It's about getting the information and making some changes. I don't want anyone to think that you have to be a clinician in order to be trauma sensitive. Sometimes that's what, that's what happens. People say, I'm just a teacher. I'm not, I don't wanna deal with this, it's, it's too much. Someone else can do this. Um, so I'm not expecting anyone to leave here today as an expert, as a therapist. That's not what trauma sensitive schools is about. Um, one, it's not even about looking for the trauma kids in the school. Like that's not the first step. Um, identifying those kids who may be my trauma kids. Um, trauma sensitive schools is universal. This, what I cover today is about all kids. Um, and I like to tell people if you don't wanna say the word trauma, because some people are really funny about that word and they say, mm, everyone hasn't had traumatic experiences. Not everyone has gone through trauma. Not everyone has had ACEs. Um, sometimes I use trauma and the word stress interchangeably. It's almost the same thing. And I don't know if anyone in here is stress free. If you are, I need to know your tips. <laughs> what I do like to tell educators, um, what happens is a principal will come to St. A, they will see, or a superintendent will come, they will see me give a presentation. They will say, all of my staff need to know this. Can you come to our district? Can you come to our school? And can you tell everyone all these great things you just told me? And I say, sure. And what happens as staff when you get into a PD that someone made you go to when you'd rather be grading your papers and, and putting up bulletin boards? Um, you're like, okay, what? 
one more thing we have to do. And trauma-sensitive schools being trauma-informed, um, what I like to help people understand through a six-hour workshop is that it's not one more thing you have to do. It's about looking at what you already do and how can you do it in a more trauma-informed um, way. For example, I've been to many schools. How many schools use check-in, check-out? How many of you have used a check-in, check-out system? So check-in, check-out system, I've seen it done really, really well, and I've seen it done not really, really well. And so when it's, when it's not really, really well, and someone would think that I'm coming to give them a brand new thing that they have to uh, learn, what I say is, okay, let's look at check-in, check-out. So I have a kid, the kid comes in in the morning. When it's not being done well, this is what it looks like. Johnny comes into class, he hands me his sheet. I say, okay, Johnny, what score do you want to get today? Or how many happy faces do you want to get today? Or how many sad faces do you think you're going to get today? And Johnny will say, I want 20 stars by the end of the day. I'll say, okay, Johnny will leave. Johnny comes back at the end of the day. I see Johnny got 15 stars. What happened, Johnny? Why didn't you do this, blah, blah. I usually focus on why Johnny didn't get the goal that he made. And so I'll tell people, if that was trauma sensitive, when Johnny comes in in the morning, we would actually have relationship. We would have conversation. Um, how's your day? How was your evening? What did you have for dinner, Johnny? Um, what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge? We would have this dialogue. Um, and it wouldn't have to take a long time because then people say, well, I don't have time. It wouldn't have to take long. It's about making a connection in the morning. And then I may find Johnny at lunch and say, well, for those teachers that get a lunch, um, I may find him at lunch and say, hey, how's it going? It's connection. It's about relationship. And at the end of the day, if Johnny only got 15 stars, we would have a conversation. What went wrong? Are you okay? Do you need me to talk? To it's just a different approach. So it's not about taking something um, and, and learning a new thing. It's about using what you already have and doing it in a different way. Um, we were working with a school in Green Bay, and the school had decided that all of the students who were struggling with reading, that this group of eight teachers were going to dedicate their morning prep, and they were going to offer time for the kids to come in and get some extra help. And so there were these teachers, they told all the kids about it. In the morning, nobody came. Next day, nobody came. About two weeks later, nobody came. And so we were, you know, asking probing questions. Why don't you think they're coming? And of course, some of the staff were like, they don't appreciate us. We're doing this. They don't appreciate us. They don't come to our stuff. We're probably going to stop. And so um, my boss said, well, did you ask kids why they don't come? You know there's a need. Why aren't they coming? And so when they finally asked kids why they weren't coming, long story short, kids were saying everyone knows that this is the, the door to go in in the morning <laughs> off the playground if you need help. And I don't want to be identified as a kid who's struggling and needs help. And so. Some teachers could have said, they're ungrateful. We, we do that sometimes. I'm giving up my morning prep to help you and you won't come. Um, all they had to do was change the door so that the kids on the playground didn't see the kids who were struggling to read go through a different door. So that's just an example of taking something you already do and just kind of reevaluating what you do so that you do it in a way that is more sensitive to um, students. Um, Things like PBIS focus on certain tiers at certain times. I like to say trauma-informed care and trauma-sensitive schools. It's universal. It's for all kids. So as I get into some of the strategies, uh, regulation, relationship, things that you can do, it's not necessarily, like I said, identifying those kids who have had some adverse experiences. It's more about this could be done for everyone. Um, Paula mentioned things can be done for movement. That's good for everybody. And so just universal strategies. This is what we call our 70i. So I will briefly touch every um, point here. So these are our seven essential ingredients. Prevalence, just how far reaching is trauma. Uh, impact, so I've had some traumatic experiences. I've had some things happen to me. How does that affect me? How does that affect my brain? How does that affect how I am in school, how I am with people? Um, perspective shift, my absolute favorite ingredient. Um, and it's about you. It's about how do you view, you know, the kids that you struggle with the most. Um, regulation, relationship, and reason to be are more of the strategy pieces of our 70i. And then caregiver capacity, um, another big one, and I know it'll be like 159 when I get to it. But it's all, I always say, we need to do that first. It's the part that says, how am I able to have my own stuff 
and deal with kids who have their stuff? Um, how do I take care of myself so that I am able to help the kids that need the help? So it's about you. How do you prevent burnout? Um, because if you're like me, you love all the kids, you wanna be every kid's mom, you wanna help every kid and all their problems become your problems. Um, it, if I had time, I'd tell you my story. It's the reason I don't teach today. The burnout was just, I was that teacher. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, as we go through today and I say the word trauma, remember some, some people, instead of trauma, it's toxic stress. It's developmental trauma, it's complex trauma. But I want you to get a good understanding that when I'm saying the word trauma, True story, you can ask um, Emily. When I was out there at lunch, I spilled my water and it started pouring down, down my leg. Um, the old me would have said, oh, it's traumatic, I had to present if my pants didn't dry, and they did. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't present my pants were wet, it was so embarrassing. Um, people use the word trauma and traumatic experience. They use it very lightly. The trauma I'm talking about today encompasses all three of those points up there, so every last one of them. Um, what I want, you can read it for yourself, but what I want you to understand the most about the trauma I'm talking about is trauma lives in the experience. It's not necessarily in the events. How many people in here have been in a car accident? How many people have been in a car accident and after your car accident, you were able to get in your car and drive away? You, or later on that day when you got a, maybe someone crashed your car, but you were able to drive and you were fine. How many of you have been in a car accident so bad that it took you a while to want to get back in the car? <laughs> That's me. Um, my husband says I'm bad luck. I've been rear-ended on the freeway like three times in my whole life and we've only been married like seven years. And so he's <laughs> like, you're bad luck. Um, but my last car accident was, was this. It was to the point where if I was in a car and I, wasn't, I wouldn't drive for almost two months, but if I was in a car, if I even heard someone's tire screech, I was scared. I would freeze up because that experience was different for me. So trauma could be the kid who um, is watching their parent be abused. Now they're not, they're not involved in the event, but they experience that event. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that the event happened to me, it's in the experience. So what about your school or your district? Do you have kids who may have experienced some of the things on the next, this slide and the next? If you didn't, if you don't, you can leave. No, um, <laughs> this isn't for you. <laughs> if you do, you may want to stay and pay attention. So how many people are familiar with the ACE study? the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. For those of you who are not, in about 95, Dr. Folletti was doing um, an obesity study and he basically had um, a medication he was giving people and he was trying to cure obesity. He was trying to see um, if he could get people to a healthier weight. And he was having great success. I mean, he, were, he was having people that were losing like 200 pounds. Um, long story short, there was a particular woman who, in like a two week period of time, one, she stopped coming. So he was wondering, why would you stop coming if you were having such great success? She stopped coming. The second piece was, it was when he asked why she stopped coming, she told him um, that when she was younger, her weight was protective, that she was sexually abused by a loved one, and that her weight made her feel more protected against um, the aggressor. And as she was losing weight as an adult, what began to happen was people were hitting on her and it made her very uncomfortable. And so I think in that two week period, he said she had gained like 20 to 40 pounds, um, 20 or 240, so just don't give me the wrong information. And so he was just like, oh my God. Um, he teamed up with Dr. Rob Anda, who was um, studying how people actually um, continue to smoke when they've stopped smoking. Basically what they found was that life events, when people were um, birthed to age 18, were a lot of the events that made people go back to um, the overeating or to continue smoking. I think he was down to like 18% of people um, who just couldn't break their smoking habit. And so he thought it was really great that other people could break the habit, but he was more concerned with why can't these people stop smoking. So as a result, um, this, this categorizes the questions that were on the ACE study. You can look it up if you need to. But there were 10 questions that were asked. They took the study, it was about 17,000 people, uh, middle, upper to middle class, middle to upper class, um, predominantly white, 
um, well educated, so every, almost everyone was college educated. Um, they clearly had jobs to be getting in health insurance from Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, and this is a result of their studies. Um, so quite alarming numbers on um, what was reported from those 17,000 people. Wisconsin decided to replicate that study in 2014, um, in 2011, I'm sorry, and this is what we found. We did not ask the last set of questions. Now the, good, the bad thing is that the numbers for Wisconsin were only 4,000 people. The good thing is I believe this year or early next year they will finish a study of 15,000 people, which would really give us good data to compare those 17,000 people in San Diego and the 15,000 people in Wisconsin. So those are the numbers. Pretty similar in some, a little higher than other. Uh, what may be more alarming, so ILS is independent living services. Those are kids who have aged out of foster care um, in Wisconsin. So St. A tracks those kids and we give them the A study as well. And this is what their numbers look like. So this is 18 to 24, age 18 to 24. Just to show you how prevalent <laughs> that ACEs are, adverse childhood experiences. Now what the ACE study doesn't ask are questions um, I'm going to jump here and go back, that Dr. Roy Wade said, you know what, I'm going to do that study, but I'm going to add my own questions on as well. And these are some of the questions he asked. He wanted it to be real for his community. I know some schools who have um, done an ACE study, which sometimes I, I, I'm not for that. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, I'm kind of against it sometimes. Um, it depends. But it makes sense to come up with questions that are real for your community. Now I'm going to go back one. If we go back into schools, Washington State are um, trendsetters on resilience, on ACEs in the classroom, and this is what they found. So they found that um, there is a high number of kids who have, so the numbers represent your ACE score. So when you take the ACE survey, you can have a zero, which means none of the events happen to you, or a 10, which means all of the events happen to you, or somewhere in between. And so this is what Washington State um, is saying the classes are looking like. And I would argue, coming from Milwaukee Public Schools, that there are hardly any zeros or ones in, in the classrooms that I've taught in, in the schools that I've taught in. And then St. A, just recently, last year when I came, um, maybe it was because of my diversity training and background, you know, we decided to say, mm, we can't always talk about trauma unless we include historical and intergenerational trauma. Um, is there a connection between the trauma that happened to um, someone's ancestors to the person that's here today? Because remember, it's not necessarily in the event. Um, I did not have to be, a, my parent didn't have to be a slave. Um, does my generation experience uh, the residue from slavery? Absolutely. If someone was living in a family from someone whose ancestors survived the Holocaust, are they impacted? Absolutely. And there's even research you can look it up called epigenetics. Epigenetics is actually the study of the epigenome gene and how it is expressed. And what they are finding, they actually, I'll tell you about a quick um, research. So there was um, a scientist who took one lab rat he took a cotton ball and he doused it in rose oil and he put it in the cage with the rat. Every time the rat would go close to the cotton to smell it, he would give it a little zap. And what the scientist was doing, when we talk about the brain, we'll talk about how what fires together, wires together. So experience, repetition comes together in the brain and makes a connection. It makes a memory. Um, he wanted that rat's brain to be what? To have rose oil and the zap so that it would know that smell means something bad. Seven generations later, every time an offspring of that original rat, seven generations, that's a lot, experienced when some of the rats would smell rose oil without the zap, they would have the same effect and impact on them that the original rat did, and they never got the zap. It was simply from the smell. So that's kind of epigenetic, so you can um, Google that research, it's amazing. What we are finding is that students who have disabilities um, sometimes can be a target for maltreatment, and, and I think we know that already. These are just some, yes? Who was the researcher for the rat rose water study? Um, Levine, Robert Levine, Peter Levine, I'm sorry. Peter Levine, yep. Um, and that was in 2012. These are some of the health risks associated with ACEs. 
You know how they say stress can kill you? Sometimes, yes, stress can kill you and it can cause a lot of other issues in our, in our lives. Um, I like this slide, it's from Dr. Anda, and it basically says, as a teacher, what would happen is, I wouldn't know much about the bottom layer. I wouldn't know much about the home life. Just if the mom was responsive or if the parents came in, for, I would know those types of things. Um, as you go higher into the social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, as teachers, as educators, that's where we start to notice there are some things going on with kids. Um, as you go up higher, they start to adopt health risk behaviors that we don't approve of, right? Um, as we go higher, you can, can't see it, but it says disease, disability, and social problems. We see that as well as teachers. Um, healthcare professionals see it. At the top, what they found from that original ACE study that was done in 95, if you had six or more ACEs, for some of the participants, they had a life shortage of 20 years compared to the other ones whose ACE score was lower. This is um, a link between ACEs and school performance. I'm gonna go past like the slides that I feel like you could kind of read and understand what I'm saying. The impact on learning and behavior. Do you see these things in your classrooms? Do you see these things with the kids that you're struggling with? What we are learning is that toxic stress will keep kids on high alert. I'm gonna show you a quick video about the impacts of toxic stress. I thought I had them up, but they're not. Now you get to see how long it takes me to get to a folder at my job because everything is buried everywhere. I'm sorry. Can you hear it? Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. Okay. So what is the impact then on someone who lives on high alert as we just saw? Um, in typical development, if everything is good, if my brain develops in the order that it should, if my neural connections um, are stay connected, as um, we saw in the video, sometimes they can become disconnected. What happens is my interactions with people, I see people as safe um, because your brain wires together based on experiences. I always say what fires together, wires together. Everyone's nice to me, I have positive people around me. My brain makes the connections that people in general are safe. Whether I know them or not, I, I am okay with relationships. Um, I have more tolerance for it. Um, if something, um, if I take a risk, it's positively reinforced. Um, I prioritize my opportunities. However, on the flip side, if my experiences with people have not always been safe, if they have not consistently be, 
um, been good, if, they, if people haven't always met my needs, if I'm not always feeling safe with people, your brain cannot wire together anything. And so that connection um, where other people in typical development can fire and wire together good things, those connections aren't made because the consistency isn't there. And that's usually based on the type of caregiving that people have. And so I start to see humans as threats. Um, how many of you are super nice to some kids and they don't care? <laughs> they just can, we say things like, oh, they sabotage relationships. I'm trying to be nice. I'm the only nice person to this kid. Um, that's what starts to happen. And it's not because it's something personal against you. Their brain is not wired to accept um, a new type of normal. If my normal is people are not nice, people don't meet my needs, people will let me down. If I call her enough names, she's going to kick me out the classroom. I'm going to use my behavior to make safe for me. Um, if bad things happen, it's on purpose. It's probably my fault and it's probably on purpose. But these are adaptive. We don't come out that way. We're not supposed to be that way. Um, so kids start to do things that are maladaptive in order to pretty much um, get our attention. Another video. So this video I really love. It's from Alberta Family Wellness. Um, it talks about how the brain is um, structured. I'm the video queen, just so you know. tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. 
Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. Our third ingredient is perspective shift, my favorite one. So let me ask you, what do you see in this picture here? Moldy bread. Um, what about the other picture? A capsule. It's penicillin in a capsule. Um, in June, I started this 10-day uh, smoothie detox. And I was going to take it on, and I was going to lose all this weight like everyone else did. And on um, my worst days, you couldn't have paid me to eat the moldy bread, <laughs> to eat a piece of moldy bread, no matter how hungry I was during this detox. But you could, in March, have paid me to take my penicillin two times a day um, for 10 days, take it all until it's gone, because I knew the benefit of taking that penicillin would get rid of strep throat. Um, and so I say that to say your perspective matters. How do you deal with the difficult kids? How do you deal with the kids who have many adverse childhood experiences? Um, the first thing I like to tell people when they, they want to know at the training, well, when are you going to get to the solution? Like, tell me what I need to do. And I say, you have to change how you think about who's in front of you. Um, the basis of what we do is based off of what we believe. If I believe a kid doesn't like me and they want to disrupt my class and so they're going to flip tables over and, and talk about my mama and, and say all these mean things to me, I'm going to handle them differently if that's what I believe. If I believe that a kid is embarrassed that I'm going to call on them next to come to the board and solve the problem and so they're just using their behavior to get out the classroom by flipping over desks and talking about my mama and you can't talk about people's mama in class but they will I will treat them differently so I always tell people the biggest solution I have is you have to figure out how you um, look at kids how you think differently about them um, it's self-fulfilling prophecy to me all day long in the classroom what I believe is what happens if I believe this about kids I'm going to get whatever I believe negative or positive I was doing a training in Racine and I had a school resource officers. And so I had this group of school resource officers and there was one who just, he wasn't drinking the Kool-Aid at all. He was like this, he just was like, we have to, it's mandatory. And I hate when they make it mandatory. It's mandatory, he didn't want to be there. And so he raised his hand and he was telling us a story about a kid who was now 17, I believe at the time. And he said this kid, when he was five, because it's a small community, he said, um, you know, we were, we were always at their house. It was a drug house. He had been in and out of foster care. You know, his mom was abused. It was, he was, it was horrible. And now here he is in school wreaking havoc on the teacher's life. I have to get him every day. He's, he's uh, threatening me. One day I even had to pull my gun on him. He's telling me this horrific story. And so I, I said to him, you know, do you see the five-year-old? Or are you, are you looking at a 17-year-old? What do you see when you see this kid? Because that matters. Um, it matters if you feel like this kid's hopeless, he should be kicked out the school and they won't do it. Um, but your perspective allows you to remember that five-year-old kid. He so vividly told us the story of this kid's life. And after the training, he said, you know, that kind of touched me what you said. He didn't want to say it in front of every, every other police officer. But he told me after the training that, that that helped him because he said, you know what, I have to remember that five-year-old kid to deal with this 17-year-old kid. And so I, I ask you, when you look at kids, on your, on your good days, it's easy to see penicillin. And on our worst days as educators, it's really easy to see moldy bread when we look at some of the kids. If we're not taking care of ourselves, if we're in a bad place, it's really hard to have a perspective shift. Um, how do we view children? This slide is more about the words we use to describe kids. Sometimes I tell people it's just the words. Instead of saying the bad kids, maybe they're the dysregulated kids. Instead of saying he's manipulative, maybe I switch what I say. Um, we talked earlier, I heard uh, Paula talk about you get that file, that big rubber band, and if you're um, courageous, you read it all, and it scares you <laughs> because of what people say about kids. 
Um, so I'm asking you to change perspective. Consider saying different things about the kids. Remember, if, if you believe something different, you may handle kids differently and it will be effective. But how do we view parents? Um, a lot of people say, well, I don't teach the parents, I teach the kids. But it absolutely matters what you think about their parents. Um, when you think kids have bad parents, if you are even interacting with parents and you don't take into consideration sometimes the parents' circumstances, that this is a child coming from a home where the parent has their own aces, um, we have to remember that parents, <laughs> are, the kids leave and then they go home. And so, you know, people tell me, well, it's not our job to work with parents. Um, I'm, I'm not a social worker, that's someone else's job. And I encourage people to realize that we have uh, um, a big part in helping the community overall. Washington State has been doing some research about resilience. How do people become resilient after um, adverse childhood experiences? What gets, so my A score is an eight. It's probably a nine, but I'm in denial about one of them. Um, <laughs> but how am I able to be successful? I'm a, I'm a wonderful wife, as my husband, and wonderful mom. And uh, in 2015, I was teacher of the year. And how am I able to have an eight A score, but still be here today asked to present to you at a conference? Um, one of the things that they are finding, Laura Porter is finding, that one of the things that help people with resilience is hope something clearly we can't measure, that if you had hope, um, you could overcome. The second thing is having two or more consistent people to support you. I like to tell people, think about if you have to move. If you had to move tomorrow, you could call all your friends up to see if they're going to help you move. And you know they'll say yes. And what's going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> My kids are sick. Oh, you don't have kids, but OK. Um, <laughs> People will be sick, their kids will have an issue, all of these things, but who are the two people that come? So they're saying people become resilient when there's been two consistent people. And the other thing is about community bridging. Do you have a community in a neighborhood that looks out for kids, that is um, all about the well-being of the family? Um, assessing perspective, if you go to that DPI website, there are many tools um, from this slide that you can have access to for free. I like to tell schools when I'm doing just one-on-one -on -one coaching, start, stop, continue model. What, what do we need to start doing? What do we need to stop doing? And what do we need to continue doing? So there's, um, these are plenty of resources on that DPI model. And then how do we change perspective? For some people, for me, I could not probably still be a teacher and come with, with the passion I have for trauma-informed care. Because when I was a teacher, I didn't care. My classroom is too big. They took away my SAGE class. I had a million issues. No one cares about me as a teacher. These kids cuss at me all day. I, wasn't, I would not be in the place I am. Some people need distance, not telling anyone to quit their job. Some people need distance and space, right? It's the summer break, we rejuvenate, and we come back with a clear mind. Um, I encourage schools to do a book study. Uh, the Boy Who Was Raised by a Dog by Dr. Bruce Perry, awesome book. And it tells you about brain development, which is so important for educators to know um, how the brain develops and how it is changed through certain um, circumstances. Regulation. Um, Movement that Paula was talking about, that's regulation. Some of you have been sitting here regulating yourself this whole time. Everyone needs regulation. I see people fanning themselves, it's regulation. People are falling asleep, it's regulation. People are rocking so they don't fall asleep. Please don't let me fall asleep for this lady. That's your body saying, uh-uh, pay attention. So you're doing things, tapping feet, clicking pins. We're regulating ourselves all the time but we rarely offer regulation for kids. The way our brain forms is from the bottom up. So our brain stem, we have a fully functioning brain stem when we're born. It is um, developed between utero and six months of age. It's responsible for our survival. It tells us to breathe, it's our heart rate, it's our, um, it allows us to swallow. Um, as you go higher in the brain into the diencephalon, that develops from age six months until two years old. The diencephalon is where your cerebellum is, movement is in the diencephalon, appetite, sleep, satiety, 
anxiety, um, those are all in the diencephalon. I call those two pieces the doing parts of my brain. It's the part of my brain that says survive, make it, move. Someone comes in with a gun, run, duck, hide, fight them, do something. Um, as you go higher into the brain, we go into the limbic system. The limbic system controls emotions, your ability to connect with people, um, mood and regulation. Your amygdala is in your limbic system. Um, as you go even higher, we get into executive functioning like the video mentioned. Executive functioning is basically what every teacher needs every student to have. Logic, reasoning, um, impulse control, the ability to connect reward and consequence. What happens, as in that video, when people are on high alert all the time, those connections, because information comes into the brain from the bottom. So if you were tired right now, you can't access your prefrontal cortex which is the part that has executive functioning because you're tired. If you were hungry, you can't pay attention. If you didn't feel safe in here, you couldn't use higher brain functioning. So picture the kids in your classroom, the kids that you work with. Um, if they are still in lower parts of their brain, if they are hungry, if they are scared, if they are um, always on high alert, high stress response, it is going to be very hard without regulation to have them access the part that's, that they need to be successful in school. The brain is also use dependent. It's a use it or lose it. What I use the most becomes the strongest as well. So the part of, if my brain says live in the doing part, that tells me to move, that tells me to be safe, that tells me to cuss kids out so they're scared of me, so that I look like the biggest baddest in the class so I don't have to fight them, that's the strongest part. And the part that tells me to control my emotions, to be regulated, to pay attention to this lady, that part is not the strongest, it's the weakest part. And what usually happens, I like to tell people, if we don't offer regulation, which is basically movement, um, rhythm, repetitive, um, things with patterns, um, a lot of the things that we need to regulate ourselves, um, things that we usually won't give to kids in class, because chewing gum in my class, do you have enough for everyone? No, spit it out. Tapping your feet, can you be still? That's distracting. Oh, you need to stand up? No, you have to sit down and do this. Those are the things we do in the class. We don't offer regulation. And I don't know about you, but on my worst days, I need the most regulation. This is um, some of Dr. Bruce Perry's work at Child Trauma Academy. What I want you to pay attention to is the mental state and then the primary secondary brain areas. What this ex very busy slide, and I'm gonna have to go through it quickly, is basically saying is when I am in this state, that is the part of the brain I have access to. And so it's really nice when we're calm, you all are in arousal right now, except for the ones who fell asleep on me, I forgive you. Um, you all are in arousal right now, that just means you're alert, you're paying attention. You have access to limbic system and cortex and prefrontal cortex. You have access to pretty much your best self right now. If you were scared, if you were in fear, if something was going on that would cause high stress response, notice now I only have um, control over the doing part of my brain. So I often encourage teachers, you have to get kids to the left, to the left, Beyonce. You have to get kids to the left in order to get them to use their brain. It's, it's a repeat of what Paula was saying earlier. What happens when I take um, a little, I'm gonna jump around just to show you something. What happens if I take a little bit of time all day, that's two to three minutes all day to offer regulation so that you have access to the higher parts of your brain. Some people would use the model on the bottom. I even think about like talk therapy. You, you get to see your therapist maybe once or twice a month for 50 minutes, 10 of it is spent doing paperwork or waiting. Um, and talk therapy is good, I'm a fan. Ask my therapist, I'm a fan of talk therapy. But what would happen if someone talked to me every day for a little bit of time? Um, could, I, could I benefit from that more? And so I tell teachers, what happens if you take two minutes, just two, before you do something and offer a little bit of regulation? It's not about giving 30 minute breaks all day. Let me go back for you. I would say, think about what babies need. If there was a baby in here crying right now, what would it need? Snuggles, yep, hold it close. Usually so it could hear a heartbeat, which is a pattern, rhythm. Padding, you know, we do the <laughs> um, We hum to it, we sing to it, we offer it a bottle. If it's wet, we'll change it. It's all the things that babies need. Um, adults and kids need it as well. 
my neck has a crick in it. I could go for some touch. So <laughs> there are just things we need. Um, they need to encompass, according to Dr. Perry, all three of the, all six of these R's, I'm sorry. What I'm doing has to feel safe. If you were struggling and I said, um, you don't look well today, could you turn to her and tell her all your problems? There's no relationship. You don't feel safe just telling any old body. You'd rather call your girlfriends and maybe go to happy hour and, and talk about all the issues of the day. The, the relational connection has to be safe and with someone I trust. Um, I talked about repetition. It has to be relevant. Um, it has to match people's skills as well. I'm not going to tell my kid in school who's struggling the most with writing to go journal his feelings when he's not regulated. He struggles with writing. That's not going to get him where I need him to be. Um, it has to be respectful, consider rhythm. I always tell people, you know, try to make it encompass all of the R's. Some kids may need to bounce a ball. Some kids benefit if someone's bouncing the ball with them. It just makes the connection better. Um, the next couple slides are just examples of each of these. So there is the um, need for sensory integration, self-regulation, relational activities, cognitive activities. I do have a um, regulation video. I'll show it only if I have one minute at the end. So I'm just going to skip through these things, which are just a list of items. What are your current strategies? When kids are not regulated, if you see them as just being bad or they just don't want to do this or they just want to be difficult, we do things like these. We time them out instead of timing them back in. One of the biggest things, um, even in that Laura Porter research, is about the connection. It is about a connection with a person. And we're so quick to suspend, to uh, kick you out my room, to time you out. Relationship. I'm not going to show you the video, but I am going to tell you to YouTube, Rita Pearson. Who's heard of Rita Pearson? She's amazing. Um, Rita Pearson has a video um, on YouTube. It's a TED Talk, actually, and it's called Every Child Needs a Champion, and it is amazing. So that's what I was going to show. I'm going to keep going. But when we talk about relationship, if I told you that was the number one thing next to hope that can get kids to become resilient after adverse experiences, consider, is your room safe? Um, and not just safe physically. Are kids emotionally safe in your room? Um, is there moral safety in your room? Have you taken the time out to recognize the things that trigger kids? Um, affection, touch, non-physical affection. Things like a thumbs up. It's a way to let someone know that you are watching them. Um, we talked about attunement. There are thing, many things we can do that say, I notice you, that builds connection between you and a kid. Um, a tomb, and I always say, pay attention to kids. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be very little things. Oh, I noticed you have a water bottle. That's it. All I said to the child was, I noticed you. Um, maybe our relationship's better, and I can say, oh, I have that water bottle at home. Pretty cool. Do you like it? And we may have a quick conversation. It's not a lot. It's just those little things that say, I noticed you. Oh, you're wearing a red sweater. Red's my favorite color end of the conversation, keep on going. It's those little doses, I call it relational wealth. Some kids are in such relational poverty, it's sad. And so how can you offer them some relational wealth by offering them bits and pieces of relationship throughout the day? And it's for everyone. So again, um, I don't want you to leave and say, next school year, let's identify all the kids who probably have a lot going on, all my trauma kids. It's for all kids. So it could just be about the classroom community, creating more opportunities for relationship. Um, and then if you think of your tier two or three kids, there could be more one-on-one -on -one things. Um, the charter school in the building that I work in, they have like an R&R &R room where kids who need sensory breaks can go into this room. And what we've encouraged them to do is to actually Think about including those things in their classroom. Um, kids don't like to get called out. I don't want to get called out for special time because I'm special and need something different. So how can um, you incorporate universal things? Reason to be is our sixth ingredient. It's really about purpose, you guys. It's about offering some kids some purpose. And some people connect their reason to be their purpose to different things. It's about the past. It's about their present. It's about their future. Who am I going to become instead of, you know, who am I today? Quick story. When I was a teacher, I um, 
I personally volunteer and I make my kids volunteer with me. Um, my younger kids like it, my teenagers hate me for it because they can't use their phones when we're serving people. <laughs> and so I said, you know what, I'm gonna get my class involved in this. And so remember, now I had a um, self-contained classroom with kids with emotional behavior disorders. They had been kicked out of many schools. You know, they, they, they weren't the most pleasant kids according to other people. And so I said, you know what, who would like to do this volunteer work with me? And of course, they all wanted to do it. Some of them had never even been on field trips. And so they wanted to do it. So once they got that taste of serving other people, it changed behavior for some of the kids, I won't say all, dramatically. Because, you know, I would give them the mama speech, you represent me in public, so if you, you can't have you acting crazy in public because you represent me, and you represent our school, and blah, blah, blah. And they changed because they had a job to do. And they wanted to be the kids to get to go somewhere. And so just helping kids to find that purpose. I'm doing a project with Boys and Girls Club in Milwaukee. And when I went to shadow the club, I was like, there was this one little girl, I'll never forget, but she was special. <laughs> she was like hitting uh, the youth counselors upside their head. She was running around. And so I looked at the guy um, running the program and I said, what are you guys gonna do about her? And he's like, oh, this is just what she does. I said, mm -mm, no, she, she needs a job. Give her something to do, running around here unstructured, doing whatever she wants because you don't wanna deal with her, that's not helping her. And so what they did was at this particular club, they made like a, um, a newspaper. And so she's the top reporter for the newspaper. She gets all the gossip, she gets to walk around appropriately, and, and it works for her. But it's just about helping kids find purpose, and that's universal. Again, I don't want anyone saying, let's go think of a plan for those trauma kids and how we can get them involved in things. Our last ingredient is caregiver capacity. Burnout, um, I'll talk about the dimensions of wellness. How many people already know a day you're gonna be sick just because you know you're going to need a mental health day? <laughs> it's, it happens, it's hard. I always say teachers have work in the most traumatic environments ever. Um, we get into probably this field because we're compassionate or maybe we've gone through something and the reason we changed was because of a teacher or a coach or a mentor. And so you get into the profession for compassion, you become empathetic, you have empathy for the kids, um, but then that turns into vicarious and secondary trauma. Their trauma is your trauma. You're up all night because you're worried about them. Um, his mom got shot and now you're, you feel really, a, you feel like you need to be his mom. As, you have taken on their trauma as your trauma. And then what happens is compassion fatigue. I don't care anymore. Um, I had a teacher, she was an amazing teacher. She was right across the hall from me. We'll call her, we'll call her Kanisha, just so I don't say her name, but. So uh, Miss Kanisha right across the hall from me, wonderful teacher, and as the, we, that was a particular year, we had three principals, so our turnover was really high. We started to see a different shift in the kids in our school. And so this teacher who was once amazing, great, compassionate, loved the kids, everybody's grandma, um, two kids collide in the hallway, laying out on the floor. One of them is bleeding. Everyone's, you know, trying to help. And this teacher who was just, she was done. She has her, I'll never forget, she has her lunch tray. She's walking through. She sees the kids. Now, these are her students. She steps over them <laughs> and says, I told them to stop running. And people were outraged. But what she was experiencing is compassion, but she didn't have anything else to give. Julia Alvarado says we can't give what we don't have. We need to take care of ourselves. There are some teachers who are homeless themselves in schools. They are dealing with the death of a loved one themselves. They are dealing with many things, their own ACEs. Um, kids have ACEs, which means they become adults, so they have their own ACEs, and that ultimately leads to burnout. Um, the next couple slides are just it would be really nice for me to say, now you guys leave here and take care of yourself and exercise and eat your carrots and celery and drink a lot of water. But I like to tell people, focus on all aspects of wellness for yourself. Um, I don't know about you, I have to focus on financial wellness because I don't do good when I'm broke. <laughs> I don't feel good in my best self when I don't have money. And so I encourage people not to just do the physical things. What can you do individually? We have um, Janice at my job, I, I tell her that I said her name, but Janice at my job had a bad spending problem, she'll tell you. And so what she did um, on New Year's, instead of her weight loss goal like every other year, she said, you know what, every time I get one of those coupons, the buy, spend $20, get some, all of those things, she would bring them to work and we would rip them up. Small things, but it's about being well in all areas. Um, just examples of self-care. We are the ones we've been waiting for. 
Um, I would love to come to your schools to personally meet with you, but the changes actually start with us. Um, th that cure that we're looking for is not out there. It is within ourselves. And I'm so sorry, but I'm completely out of time. Um, St. A will come to your school. I, like I said, this was a very rushed, and I apologize, a very rushed hour presentation of an actual six hour presentation. Sometimes we do it in four. Um, my information is actually on this slide. I have a couple cards up here and I'll be willing to talk to anyone who would like to talk to me. But look up those videos I told you. Also look up B-A-L-A-V-I-S-X, Bala VZX. It is a regulation um, activity. I love to do it. We do it actually in our office. Um, it's about bouncing balls and how it gets you regulated. So look that up, look up Rita Pearson's video. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.